And so here I am to give the brief welcome that I promised I would give. I want to welcome everyone to this year's uh, Osler Business Law Forum. We're delighted to have Professor Brian Cheffins here. Um, in a few minutes, Professor Len Rotman, our Purdy Crawford Chair, will introduce Professor Cheffins. Um, I just want to say a few words about the, the forum, the Osler Business Law Forum. It was originally established I'm just quickly doing the math. I can't, so I'll say in 2001. So it's been around for quite some time. And the general purpose of the forum is to foster the exchange of ideas about business law at the law school uh, within the legal and business communities and in the broader Atlantic community and beyond. Uh, we're proud of the contributions that we make and uh, continually try to make to um, debate around issues, uh, uh, current issues of business law, and this business law forum is one way that we have of doing this. Um, so I very much hope you enjoy today's lecture. It's on a topic um, that our guest is eminently qualified to speak about, but now I will turn it over to Professor Len Rotman to tell us a little bit more about our guest, Professor Brian Cheffins. Over to you, Professor Rotman. Thanks, Dean Cameron. Uh, I'm also quite looking forward to, uh, to hearing the, the talk today, as I actually haven't had an opportunity to, to meet Professor Cheffins just yet in person, but I'm very well familiar with his writings and quite looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Uh, so I've been given the pleasure of saying a few words of introduction, and I'd like to welcome Professor Cheffins to Halifax, to Dalhousie, and to welcome him back to Canada. Uh, Professor Cheffins is an internationally regarded authority on the issue of corporate governance. He is currently the S.J. Berwin Professor of Corporate Law at Cambridge, and that's an appointment that he's held since 1998. And as I said, he's a, he's a Canadian, originally from Montreal. He was educated at the University of Victoria, at UBC, and at Cambridge. Prior to his name professorship at Cambridge, he was a professor at UBC for about 10 years. He's also held visiting appointments at Duke, Harvard, Oxford, Stanford, Western, UBC, and the Instituto de Empresa, de Empresa in Madrid. Sorry about my Spanish. Uh, most recently, he was the Thomas K. McCraw Business History Fellow at the Harvard Business School. He's been awarded numerous, numerous prizes and fellowships including what I thought was most recognizable and noteworthy, a Guggenheim Memorial Fellowship, and the Frederick I Medal for Contributions to Italian Academia, which I want to ask him more about uh, later on. I thought that was really quite interesting. Uh, he's also a fellow of the European Corporate Governance uh, Institute. His primary research interests are corporate governance and corporate law generally, and he's particularly interested in the economic and historical aspects of corporate law and corporate governance. And as I as I'd indicated before, Professor Cheffins has written many, many articles on various issues of corporate law, corporate governance, corporate theory, corporate history, uh, quite an impressive, impressive list. Uh, in terms of the books that he's written, he's a co-editor uh, co of the History of Modern US Corporate Governance, as well as the author of Company Law, Theory, Structure, and Operation, the trajectory of, in parentheses, corporate law scholarship, and corporate ownership and control, British business transformed. Please join me in welcoming Professor Brian Chaffins. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers of the um, Osler Hoskin um, Business Law Forum for inviting me to speak. It's a great honor to give this presentation. Uh, I'm delighted to return to Halifax in the Schulich uh, School of Law after an absence of, of a decade. With respect to logistics, I'd particularly like to thank um, Kim Brooks, who as Dean initially invited me, uh, Dean Camille Cameron, who followed through, uh, Dean Cameron's assistant, Elizabeth Sanford, for her help with all the logistics, and finally, Professor Rotman for his very kind introduction. Um, now, the, what I'm gonna talk about today is the history of corporate governance. Um, and in so doing, I'm drawing upon a number of papers that I've written in this area. I'll just click through them here. Dum, dum, dum. Um, and what you'll see there is, uh, if you have, just have a chance to glance at them quickly, it's, uh, this writing has primarily an American orientation. 
why is this? Um, and the lecture will as well, uh, why? Um, that's because the topic of corporate governance first came to the fore in the United States. So when you want to talk about the history of corporate governance, it makes sense to go where it started, which is the United States. Um, I'll also talk today about developments in Britain and in Canada. I've written about um, the UK. I have not written about Canada, but I have a series of conjectures that I can offer, which I think are plausible. Um, and, but what I want to do before I turn to the history is, I am assuming here that not everyone is familiar with what corporate governance actually is, and it strikes me as kind of necessary to, before you go into the history, to have some familiarity with what corporate governance is. And so that is what I'm going to start with. Um, now, I'll start by defining it. Uh, essentially, corporate governance, what it does is it encompasses uh, the checks and balances that affect those who run companies. Um, and these balances, checks and balances, can be external or internal. External corporate governance mechanisms, what they do is they operate independently of the public companies that they affect. Internal corporate governance, on the other hand, they're intri intrinsic features of the corporate form. I'm talking here about boards and I'm talking about shareholders. They can impose checks on the executives who manage the company. There's disagreement about whether corporate governance, whether it should focus pretty much entirely on the interests of investors, primarily shareholders, or whether corporate governance should be thought about in the broader sense of those who are stakeholders in companies. I'm not going to get into that debate. It is a lively one. But there is uh, a consensus that when you're talking about corporate governance, you are focusing primarily on publicly traded companies, not their closely held counterparts. Um, now, I mentioned that uh, what I'm going to talk about today has largely U.S. orientation. Um, it's important to note uh, the way in which corporate governance developed has been strongly influenced by the manner in which um, ownership and control of U.S. public companies is configured. Um, and what this has led to is managerial control within those companies, therefore corporate governance, what it does is it responds to this and imposes checks on managers. Um, how do you get to this point of managerial control? Well, you start by looking at corporate legislation, as in Canada, what you will see is U.S. corporate statutes, what they do is they allocate managerial control to the board of directors. How does it get to the managers? Well, what happens is that these shareholder elected boards, what they do is they delegate heavily uh, to full-time corporate executives who then in turn run the company. Um, now, the, what you could potentially have shareholders having a meaningful influence, but this is unwound to a significant degree with U.S. public companies because the standard format with a U.S. public company is that it will lack a substantial single shareholder or a cohort, of a, 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 a tight coalition of shareholders with enough shares to dominate corporate affairs. Now, what that means is that because shareholders elect the boards, and they're not, shareholders aren't doing very much, boards have delegated to the executives, what you have is a situation where in U.S. public companies, they fall under managerial control. Now, this has been well known. Um, the I, idea of managerial control of companies can be traced back to a very well-known 1932 book by Burley and Means, uh, The Modern, Modern Corporation and uh, Private Property. Um, and in this book, what the authors did is they asserted that while the law treats um, a company's shareholders as the owners of the company, investors in publicly traded firms in the U.S. at that point did not act in the manner you would expect of an owner. Instead, what happened was that shareholders left it to full-time executives to deal with matters of importance. The upshot was there was what Burley and Means characterized as a separation of ownership, the shareholders, and control in the managers. Now, in the years after Burley and Means outlined their separation of ownership and control characterization of the public company, 
Many commentators criticized this arrangement, saying that what you had was potentially unaccountable managers. There was, they were, the concern was that shareholders, because they were diffuse, would be passive and managers could do basically what they wanted. Now, that is a source of concern, but it is important to note that a separation of ownership and control can have benefits. Um, for instance, um, for a publicly traded firm, when it has widely held shares, it will be fairly easy as and when that firm wants to access capital markets, equity markets, they can do that. They can get money from the stock market. They don't have to have recourse to dominant shareholders who will, uh, who, to, who will be providing cash for the company. It's also potentially beneficial in terms of hiring the people to run the business. If you have a um, company which is dominated by a family, you could have problems because what might happen is that there will be a tendency to bring in members of the family to manage the company even if they are not the best qualified to do that. When you have a situation where there is a separation of ownership and control, that is not a problem. What you can have is thoroughly meritocratic appointment of executives, and that can be beneficial. Now, that said, there are downsides. Um, if you, in a situation where there's a separation of ownership and control, by definition, the executives only own a small percentage of the shares. That means that when they are generated, when they're running the company, they will, as shareholders, benefit very little. And that, in turn, means that you can have a situation where they may want to use their control over corporate assets to further their own interests at the expense of shareholders. They might figure they need some me time. That what you've got is a situation where, you know, they're creating all this wealth for the shareholders. Come on, you know, we deserve some, too. Um, now, the so what this has been characterized as, this, this potential problem, has been characterized by economists as the agency cost problem in public companies. Um, and it's said that when managers pursue their own agenda at the expense of shareholders, they impose agency costs on the shareholders. How can they do this? There's a bunch of different ways. They can shirk, that's inattentiveness, so they could play golf. That's unlikely because they're not lazy, they're real type A people or maybe they pursue their own business ventures. Um, another possibility is they might play it safe. You know, they've got a good gig, they don't want to get dislodged, and, you know, don't have to, don't want to be too innovative, just, you know, just, just want to stay in control, and, but in a way that ultimately is going to have adverse consequences for the company against its rivals. Um, more egregiously, there can be what can be referred to as looting. Um, and I don't mean to go to the, the company safe and take cash out. I mean that there is improper diversion of corporate assets. These could be unduly lavish offices, um, or uh, there can be foreign travel to conferences, things like this. Perhaps most um, controversially, there can be quote unquote excessive executive pay, where the executives use their influence over the board to ensure that they get paid over the odds uh, given what their contribution to the business is. Now, this all sounds pretty gloomy. Um, you have managerial control, you have a situation where they want to act in their own interests at the expense of shareholders. This sounds pretty bad for the publicly traded firm, uh, the widely held company. And yet, in the United States, the widely held company dominates. This is also the case in Britain that companies with the few shareholdings publicly held are the um, leading firms within those two countries. How can this happen, given the agency cost problem? Well, part of this is because there are external constraints that, exec that uh, executives operate under. For instance, there's the labor market for executives. Um, these are ambitious people. They might want to go and work elsewhere for more money. Now, how, what's the best way to do that? Well, it's certainly not to run your company into the ground, because you go to your, your alternative employers and say, how did your last job go with CEO? Well, we went bankrupt. That's not going to work so well. So they want to perform well uh, to get jobs elsewhere. There's markets for products and services. So you can find all sorts of companies that what happens is that they, um, the, the company is run badly, market share will fall, revenues will collapse, 
and the company can go out of business. And you can think of retailers, all sorts of retailers right now who are facing precisely these kinds of problems. Um, capital markets. If managers have ambitions for their companies, they need money to fulfill these. When they do this, they will be subject to external scrutiny, either by um, in, um, potential shareholders or potential creditors. Um, finally, there's the market for corporate control. If a company is poorly managed, its share price will fall. What you can get is someone will say, look, those assets, they, they, you should be getting way more out of them. They make a bid to the shareholders and say, you know, we'll give you a little bit more of the share price, give us control, and we can make a lot of money from that. Now, why is this um, a market-oriented constraint? Because executives don't like this, because what will happen if after a hostile takeover uh, bid, they lose, they're gone. So what they do, get out in front of the problem and say, actually, what we'll do is we're going to run the company in the interest of shareholders in the first place. Keep the share price high enough so that there's no bidder who comes in and says, we can do better. Okay? Um, now, then you'd think, ah, oh, well, good. We're all sorted. The, more, the market will solve it. Eh, except that these market constraints, while significant, are by no means perfect. For instance, market for managerial talent, how often do CEOs move around? Not a lot. Where you get mobility is lower down, not so much at the top. Markets for products and services. Well, if a company has market power, it can take years for the company to be brought to its knees by the market. Market for corporate control. Takeovers, they're expensive, they're cyclical, and now, particularly say in the United States, there's lots of defensive techniques that can be used to stop hostile bids. So that means that executives, despite these market forces, retain scope to pursue their own agenda, at least to some extent. And what occurs then is that internal corporate governance mechanisms, I've said there's, I've just been talking about external mechanisms, internal mechanisms can operate as a beneficial corrective. Um, and so what's happened is that over the past, um, since the mid-1970s, there has been emphasis, increased emphasis, on these internal mechanisms. Uh, they've, a lot of them have been there, but they were kind of ignored before that, but they've been emphasized more since. What do I, what are the, and there's three basic themes that have come to the fore with respect to how corporate governance has changed. One, with respect to the board of directors, you look to independent or outside directors, those who are not executives, to keep an eye on the executives. Second, you reform executive pay. What you do is you align pay with performance. Then the executives go, oh, well, we'll make a lot of money if the company gets run well, and that can help to eliminate the agency cost problem. Finally, what you do is you encourage shareholders to intervene. Even though they're diffuse, you say, come on, you know, get with it, and you will benefit if you, um, uh, if you intervene when companies are going off the rails. Um, now, I've talked about the nature of ownership and control in the U.S. It's standard with, with the large publicly traded firm that there be diffuse share ownership. Um, and this can be characterized in the U.S. as an outsider arm's length system of ownership and control. The U.S. has this, Britain does, probably no other country has it in quite its purest form. Why is it referred to this? It's outsider oriented because large public companies lack a dominant shareholder. Um, so all the shareholders are outsiders. Arm's length reflects the fact that they're typically passive, that they don't intervene. Um, in most other countries, to greater or lesser degrees, you can characterize um, uh, corporate governance as insider control oriented. Why is this? Well, what you've got is um, companies are less likely to be publicly traded than they are in the U.S. or the U.K., and crucially what you have is typically those public companies have a dominant shareholder. That will be the insider uh, side of things, and they will, as dominant shareholders, exercise control. So, therefore, it's control-oriented. Where does Canada fit on here? Um, Canada has a well-developed stock market by global standards. And its corporate economy shares key features with those of the U.S. and the U.K. However, with respect to ownership and control, so what you have here, this is put together by Mork et al. in 2005. This is the proportion of firms that lack a 10% shareholder, um, which they treat as 
freestanding and widely held. And what you'll see here, the most recent data is 98, typically it's about a quarter of Canadian companies are like that. And what that means is that, um, is that the typical arrangement in a Canadian public company is there will be a meaningful shareholder. So characterizing Canada as being outsider arm's length, not, not correct. Uh, and this in turn has um, important corporate governance implications. Now insider control oriented corporate governance, it can be good. Um, how can it be good? Well, one thing that's good about it, what I've been talking about is how these managers with the power they have can do all sorts of naughty things. Well, if you have a dominant shareholder, what you're going to have is you're going to have a shareholder who has both the incentive, because it's a lot of their money at stake, and the power because of their shareholder votes to um, exercise influence over the managers. So managerial fidelity to the dominant shareholder at the very least is much li less likely to pose a problem. Because the executives know if they go off the rails and the dominant shareholder twigs to this, they're gone. Okay? Um, large Brock holders, I mean, and they're better positioned to do this because they have so much money at stake, they tend to be well informed compared to their diffuse shareholder counterparts in the US and the UK. So they're more likely to be vigilant. Um, also, a company with a block holder, it can benefit from a longer time horizon. It's often said that companies that are widely held, all they're doing is running around for the latest financial results. Um, if you have a dominant shareholder, they can afford to play the long game, and that can be beneficial um, because by virtue of the continuity which exists, they can pursue projects that are going to take place over a longer period of time, and they develop strong relationships with key stakeholders, such as valued employees and important customers. So you think, well, well this must be the way to go. Um, except that um, there are downsides to, uh, inside um, the, to, um, this, to these dominant shareholder companies. The problem is that what can happen is they can uh, act in their own interests, the dominant shareholders, to the expense of outside investors. The term that can be used to describe this is that, and they'll be working with management here because management knows which side of the um, uh, the bread is buttered, which is, you know, they want to get along with uh, the dominant shareholders. And what they will do is they will extract what can be referred to as private benefits of control. Um, how can they do this? Well, you might get a powerful entrepreneur who's running a business. They're no longer suited to do it. They're past their sell-by date, but they kind of love it. So they just stick around until the thing just goes down. Um, or what they might do is got, you know, I tell you, my son, my daughter, they, you know, they, the world just doesn't appreciate just how bright they are. So I'm going to show them, and I'm going to put them in charge. And that doesn't go so well. Um, again, more, well, is it more nefariously, what they can do if they're, you know, they're keen to get some money out of this successful publicly traded company and get some more into their own hands, is they can arrange um, transaction, related party transactions with companies that they own 100% that are in favor of the 100% company. So the money slides out of the public company to the benefit of the dominant shareholder. Um, and so what you've got is a different set of corporate governance problems. And I'll tie this in by looking at the particular Canadian context. What you've got, given what I talked about in terms of ownership and control setup, if your concern is dominant shareholders, then what you've got in Canada is that the priority instead of accountable managers arguably should be Let's not let the block holders get out of line. Um, and Morgan Young said about this in 2006, in Canada, corporate governance problems are likely to pit public shareholders against uh, controlling shareholders, as in Hollinger, as to, pit, um, as to pit shareholders against managers, as in Enron. What are they talking about here? Um, well, uh, uh, I think there'll still be quite a few people here who will have heard of Enron, which was a widely held firm, energy firm, that collapsed in a huge scandal in 2001. Um, a, couple, few, a few years later, um, you had a scandal at Hollinger, um, and this was um, run by Con, well, run, yeah, to a substantial extent, by Conrad Black. He owned a dominant stake. So what you had here was Enron, widely held company, managers doing naughty things, Can Canadian uh, corporate governance scandal at the same time, it was a dominant shareholder problem. And the implications of this, Morkin Young, and this is this long quote at the bottom, Canadian corporate governance laws, regulations, and best practices must attend to controlling versus public shareholder disputes in firms with controlling shareholders. 
and to shareholder manager disputes in firms without them. This requires a fundamentally broader focus than in the United States and the United Kingdom, where controlling shareholders are relatively rare and good governance is mainly about preventing or solving shareholder manager disputes. So that means in Canada it's a little more complicated. You can't lose sight of these dominant shareholders. All right, um, I've now introduced you to corporate governance. I'll talk about some history now. Okay? Now, the issues which are involved with corporate governance history have been around in the broadest sense since the corporate form has existed, concerns about how companies are run and how they can, things can potentially go off the rails. So you could at some level say that the history of corporate governance extends back to even to the 17th century when you had charter corporations such as the East India Company and the Hudson's Bay Company. Um, while that's the case, and you could theoretically extend the history of corporate governance back that far, you'd be sort of twisting things around because if you went before 1975 and you said, ah, oh, I'm investigating the history of corporate governance, they wouldn't know what you were talking about. Okay? It, the term was not used. And I'll just illustrate this through a series of slides. So uh, here what you've got is uh, just or is um, academic articles, how often corporate governance was talked about in the U.S. and in US, major U.S. newspapers. So here's how much corporate governance was talked about up to 1974. Uh, one there, and that's it. Okay? So it started in the 1970s. Okay? And this wasn't just the U.S. Uh, what you've got, in the U.S. it started in the 70s. Other countries, it was happening later. So here's Britain. So Financial Times, well-known newspaper, uh, almost nothing, and then Boom, up there, 1990. Uh, the Guardian Observer, another well-known English newspapers, nothing, nothing, nothing. 1990 is when things happened there. What about Canada? Um, so the Globe and Mail, a couple of burps in the 19, because it's, you know, being that close to the U.S., someone would have recognized it. But then it was the 80s and really the 90s it took off. When did academics in Canada start writing about it? A few bumps here. Was, this was a seminar, this was a conference in the U of T Law Journal. Um, but basically, you know, that was how that went. Okay? So that just gives you a sense. Um, with corporate governance, if you're talking about the history of it, sure, you go back to 1948 and say, in time travel, I'm investing in the history of corporate governance. As I said, people, what? What are you talking about? So um, now, to be fair, to flip things around, this, maybe this is just a change in terminology. Okay? Maybe nothing's really changed, and suddenly, oh, corporate governance, that's what we'll talk about, but nothing had changed. I don't think so. It was more than a change in terminology. Um, and why? Well, so what was going on is that you had a situation where um, the use of the term corporate governance reflected a change in the way that people were thinking about accountability mechanisms within companies. And what was happening was that um, what was happening was that there was increased emphasis on the internal mechanisms of corporate accountability and that was what the use of the term corporate governance was capturing. It was not simply terminological. Now I'm going to make that point uh, uh, after I um, uh, talk and to provide a platform for where things were at before the change. And this can be referred to as the, um, the managerial capitalism era. Um, and what, you, what I'm talking about here is the 1950s and 1960s. Here I'm returning now to the United States. And what I'm talking about is the way in which publicly, quoted, uh, publicly traded firms, the way in which they were operating, and it was an era of managerial capitalism. Um, now, because what you had was a situation where ownership was, separated from, or was separating from control. That's what Burley and Bean said. It took a couple of more decades before you had a situation where widely held firms were truly dominant. So you get to the 50s and the 60s. Um, and this was a situation where you had managerial capitalism. Um, and what's meant by this? Well, it was a situation where managers were in control because of the lack of dominant shareholders. Um, and it was perfectly set up for managers to be in control because the majority of shares were owned by retail investors, individuals, and it was said of them in 1958, that they were known for their indifference to everything about the companies they owned except dividends and the approximate price of the stock. Anything else? Didn't care. What about boards? Um, boards, they also weren't particularly likely to constrain management. 
Uh, because in this situation, what it was is that typically boards had a lot of insiders on them, and the outside directors were carefully selected by the insiders for their connections or their friendliness. So this is what an Eastern, this is what the Wall Street Journal said about an Eastern manufacturer said about boards. Quote, 1960, quote, too many boards still meet in secret so they can pass all of the resolutions at once and spend most of the time talking about shooting, fishing, and women. So the upshot was that, uh, uh, that managers led and directors and shareholders followed. Now, um, you'd think, wow, like this is just a recipe for a disaster. These managers are going to be putting their hands in the till all the time, and you know, this is going to be a huge problem. And yet, 50s and 60s, there was not much appetite for change. You can, if you search around, you can find some kind of two-bit instances of managerial misconduct, but there were no Enrons, not even close. There were conglomerate mergers where they tacked a bunch of businesses together. They were kind of stupid. Um, but basically, as I said, little appetite for change. Um, why is this? Well, shareholders were doing well. The U.S. economy was really rocking in the 50s and 60s, and shareholders collaterally benefited from this, so they weren't too keen to upset the apple cart. Um, but there also, crucially, was confidence that executives running these publicly traded firms would not take improper um, personal advantage of their positions. They would not really, um, they would, there would not be egregious misconduct in which they would engage. Uh, and this is reflected uh, by Burley. Now, Burley, again, wrote the 1932 book, and he did it to scare people. It's like, you know, look, I mean, these leading firms in the United States are being run by managers who are unaccountable. This is pretty scary. By 1959, he acknowledged, you know, things aren't bad. Things are pretty good. He said, quote, the principles and practice of big business are considerably more responsible, more perceptive, and in plain English, more honest than they were in 1929. So, Everything seemed to be good. Why was this? Okay, I mean, managerial control, why weren't they just going for a lot of me time? Um, now, for uh, various reasons, um, the, basically what it was is that the nature of corporate leadership at the time was constrained in ways that we probably have difficulty imagining now with the way executives are uh, characterized and the way in which they think. Um, the prototypical executive at this time was a bureaucratically oriented, quote unquote, and I, you know, I know the term, organization man, but you know, it, just the way the demographics were, that's just the way it was. And what it was is, the, the key here is organization, because what they did is they subordinated their personal aspirations for the, um, in favor to foster the pursuit of corporate goals. They were focusing on the organization. And what you had, and again, I realize it's not gender-neutral language, and, um, but it wasn't gender-neutral then, um, nor is it still really now. CEOs functioned as industrial statesmen, and what that meant by that was that they specialized in accommodating a wide range of constituencies, and they were cornerstones of, and this is a, a U.S. social scientist saying this, um, a moderate, pragmatic corporate elite based primarily in the largest American corporations. Um, so, why were they not putting their hands in, well, not their hands in the proverbial till that's too harsh? Why weren't they grabbing more, more me time? Well, one thing that mattered, um, these executives, their formative era was the Depression and World War II. And these were situations where uh, people were cooperating to get along. There was um, the development of common values of duty, honesty, and service. That may well have been a constraint. Um, but there were other more pragmatic reasons. One, um, banks were pretty heavily regulated then, so if you wanted to get money to do stuff, it was kind of hard. The banks weren't handing out the money uh, that often. And so adventurous risk, risk takers, banks just look at you and go, I don't think so. Um, now, there were other factors. Um, to the extent that executives were going to go crazy, unions were keeping a pretty close look at them. And that's hard, you're unions, are you kidding? But back in the 1950s, 35% um, of uh, employees in the U.S. were members of unions. And they were very powerful in some really crucial industries. Federal securities laws, which were passed in the mid-1930s, they imposed constraints. The way it was described is David Skeel in a 2005 book, what he did is he drew upon the Greek myth of the ill-fated Icarus to um, 
described as I Icarian, um, the, you could have these business people who were Icarian. They would take risks, 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 fly close to the sun and <laughs> crash. So he has to talk about like the 50s and 60s, like what happened to these Icarian people? Well, he said because of the disclosure involved with federal securities laws, he said it made it, quote, much harder for an Icarian entrepreneur to disguise what he was doing and take desperate gambles. So that was a constraint. There was also market structure was a constraint. What you had was a situation where in key industries in the U.S., they were oligopolies. Tiny handful of companies dominated these. And what they did is they could be kind of cozy in this situation. They could take a safety first approach. No need to take ridiculous gambles because, hey, we're on top. Um, so what you had is uh, a situation where, um, despite the agency cost problem, despite appalling internal corporate governance, they weren't doing bad things. And this, you know, you didn't need corporate governance. Things then began to change. Um, yeah, uh, so the cracks beginning to appear. Well, what happened was, as you move to the 1970s, conditions were changing. And what was happening was the corporate prosperity that had muted concerns, it was fading. Recessionary era, things were becoming more expensive. Um, things were just a lot tougher. Um, there was meaningful foreign competition for the first time, too. So um, you, you just couldn't take into account just the good times, everyone, everything would be fine. Um, now, the, these, there were early uh, casualties of these changing conditions, and what it did is it set the scene for the initial use of corporate governance terminology, as I showed with the slides a few, uh, few minutes ago. Um, there was also, in, and then again, this wasn't just terminology, there was increased emphasis on internal governance mechanisms as, doing a me as playing a meaningful role, ones that were largely ignored during the heyday of managerial capitalism. So where were these early casualties? Well, one was Penn Central. Penn Central was a railway crunched together through a merger and then through a real estate empire on top, um, and it all collapsed in 1970. It was said in this context, um, the, well, the directors had really no clue what was happening, uh, and the board was characterized as a rubber stamp and a horrible example. Then you also had what was happening um, there were revel revelations of dozens of U.S. companies that were engaging in e uh, ethically dubious or outright illegal domestic and foreign payments to secure favored treatment. Outside directors of these companies had no clue what was going on. They had no clue. The SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, said of this, they characterized it as, quote, frustration of our system of corporate accountability. So beginning to see some problems arising here. And it was in this context that corporate governance came onto the agenda. Uh, what you had in 1977 is that the SEC held six weeks of public hearings uh, to examine um, shareholder participation into the corporate electoral process and corporate governance generally. Now, ultimately, the SEC refrained from making substantial recommendations as a result of the hearings, but it was certainly being talked about, and in 1980, two bills were proposed in Congress that contained a series of corporate governance related proposals, such as mandating an independent, uh, that, uh, independent directors form a majority on the board. Um, so you had corporate governance was of interest in Washington. It was also of interest elsewhere. You had the American Bar Association and the Business Roundtable. The Business Roundtable is a uh, group of, of chief executive officers, and what they were doing in, the, in 19, uh, the late 1970s, they were making proposals saying that the boards of public companies should typically have a majority of outside directors, and that they should delegate key tasks to um, committees, nomination committee, compensation committee, and audit committee, staffed entirely by independent directors to enhance accountability. The American Law Institute, what it does is it undertakes projects to clarify and modernize areas of the law. It said, yeah, we're going to take on corporate governance. So a lot of talk inside and outside Washington about corporate governance. Um, and now to get back to the point, this was not just a matter of terminology. What was happening was there, there was an emphasis on looking into the company to, to try to enhance managerial accountability. The consensus was in the 50s and 60s, if you want to impose constraints on managers of public companies, you're going to have to do it through forces external to the corporation. Law, just tell them they can't do it. Public opinion, or you could have market forces. But in the 1970s, the emphasis switched 
which was there was people began to believe that look if we energize the board of directors they can do serious work to keep these these managers from going off the rails you won't get another Penn Central you won't get all this bribery um, shareholders it was a little later for them shareholders in the 70s were still viewed as kind of hopeless but in the 80s things changed and they began to be seen as a potential um, a potential uh, force for good and for change and this happened because of what is called the deal decade on um, the 1980s now what happened was interest in Washington diminished in corporate governance why was this Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1980 he being market friendly was not interested in the corporate governance initiatives of the SEC or those in Congress they died um, also what happened was that um, you had a situation where in terms of the intellectual movement law and economics sort of a free market oriented um, spin on things became influential and they said you know the market will take care of it so interest in corporate governance seemed to be waning for a little while um, what you had though in, in the 1980s, and this was going to set the scene ultimately for corporate governance to come back even stronger, was that um, you had a lot of hostile takeovers. And I've already talked about um, how hostile takeovers, how they can be a, an external mechanism of corporate accountability. That was fine, things ticking along in the 80s, people go takeovers will do it, takeovers will do it, we don't have to worry about this other stuff too much. But then the deal decade ended, and I don't just mean chronologically. The, the, uh, the takeover boom of the 1980s collapsed and hostile bids were particularly hard hit. And what this did is people were going, gosh, you know, if we don't have takeovers to keep uh, these managers attentive, what are we going to do exactly? And so uh, there was an article in the Washington Post, for instance, that noted uh, in 1990 that the takeover artists have all but disappeared, acknowledging that this created apprehension that without the Raiders standing in the shadows, a key force has disappeared that had served to keep U.S. business lean, um, lean, energetic, and resourceful. And so then people went, hmm, what are we going to do to keep these managers in line if we don't have the hostile takeovers? This was a boon for corporate governance. Why? Because then attention was refocused on internal governance mechanisms and what they could do to keep managers in check. Twinned with this was that managerial capitalism was fading away rapidly because what you had was a situation of a rethink of the position of shareholders. Now I've indicated under managerial, under managerial capitalism you had these industrial statesmen, they took into account the interests of all stakeholders and you know everything was calm, move forward. And what happened was by virtue of the deal decade they were forced to start thinking a lot more about shareholders. Why is that? Why was there increased emphasis on shareholders? Um, well, what happened was the, this increased emphasis on shareholders inculcated the way corporate governance was thought about. In this market-friendly decade, that was crucial. Because corporate governance in the 70s, it kind of had a, I mean, Ralph Nader, for those of you who know who he was, was a strong advocate of corporate governance in the 1970s. And that would be enough to send people running for the hills in the 80s pretty much but then shareholder value began to inculcate thinking about corporate governance and why was this the takeover wave was crucial here what was happening was people typically assume shareholders they're hopeless but then in the 80s what was happening is that the fate of the largest companies in the US was hinging quite frequently on whether shareholders accepted takeover bids or not and that meant in turn people had to go ah you know, shareholders and their votes, they really matter. So what you had was that corporate governance was getting transformed from its kind of soft left 70s version into a more, I guess, neutral, but certainly shareholder incorporated um, entity that fortified its strength. Um, and you could see this, what you had was, um, in terms of shareholders becoming more involved, is the, the percentage of shares owned by institutional investors, pension funds and so on, increased dramatically. Um, from the 60s to the 80s so they were owning a lot of the shares and what that meant was they had voting clout and they had reason to care because they had a lot of money in these public companies and the catalyst initially for them becoming involved in corporate governance in a way that retail investors never would was takeover defenses institutional shareholders they loved they loved takeovers because takeovers there would be takeover to premium 
and then they would, that would improve their returns. Then the nefarious managers started putting in takeover defenses. And the institutional shareholders, they opposed this, led by CalPERS initially, a, a California pension fund. Um, and that was where they started really beginning to push on governance issues. But they did not stop there. Because then as you shift to the 1990s, is really when corporate governance in its modern form began to take hold. Um, you had a situation where, and this was referred to by the Financial Times, the 1990s were the decade of corporate governance, according to the Financial Times. Expectations rose about the contribution boards and shareholders could and should make. And you had, for instance, talking about boards, Jay Lorsch, an expert on boards, said in 2001, after he'd characterized them as pawns in 1989, he said in 2001, they're like potentates. These are the directors are like potentates. Um, according to Ron Gilson, a very well-known U.S. corporate law academic, directors were energized by 2001. Um, and why this happened? Well, they were getting fortified by input by institutional shareholders who were pushing boards to fire CEOs more, and they were pushing them to try to, um, to put in um, greater emphasis on performance-oriented pay. Um, now, why did corporate governance become a higher priority in the 1990s? Why was this happening? Well, by this point, managerial capitalism had pretty much completely unraveled in the sense of, you know, your industrial statesman, organization man sort of um, situation. Because what you had was a situation where executives were now beginning to matter more to their companies and their contribution they could make than they could previously. And in this context, what this meant is executives quote, began to matter more. Then what should happen is investors should be going, you know, we got to keep an eye on these people and we will you rely on boards to do this. Why were executives mattering more? Well, one was deregulation, was deregulation. Because what was happening here was that um, the oligopolistic markets of the 50s and 60s, they were being unraveled by deregulation. And what that meant was that ambitious companies could prosper, and ones that had been protected previously, they were suddenly exposed to the markets in ways they never had been before. So the way, the extent to which executives were performing effectively mattered more. Union power drained away. To the extent that unions were a constraint on executives, unions, by virtue of a um, combination of economic forces and, and uh, legal change, they became way less significant. That meant if executives wanted to change things up to deal with uh, foreign competition, intensified competition, they could outsource and downsize in ways that they could have never done in the 50s and 60s. Um, they also had um, greater access to finance. So um, leverage, so what happened was in the 1980s is you had a dramatic um, unshackling of corporate finance. So suddenly, companies could get access to money they never could before. So that meant that they could grow in ways they couldn't, uh, could have before. Um, and as explained by Thomas, the opportunities for American executives expanded tremendously. But it was also kind of scary because what happened was that public companies in their oligopolistic form in the 50s and 60s, they could kind of coast along. By the, uh, by the 80s and pretty much through the 90s, what was happening was if you had bright sparks, disruptors was the term frequently used. Disruptors in the 50s and 60s, they couldn't have got the capital they needed to challenge. 90s, no problem. Venture capital, all sorts of ways in which they could get money and they could challenge much more effectively. So the upshot was that you had a situation um, where the uh, managerial function was changing dramatically. And in, you know, you, so you, it was a situation where people began to think executives really matter a lot more than they used to. Um, and what happened was that people began to, in the quote there, being a CEO ain't what it used to be. And so then you had the superstar CEO. Um, and this was in the late 90s. You might recognize her. She's famous for another reason now, um, Carly Fiorina. Um, and she's currently running for president. But she was an example of a superstar CEO of this era. And what happened was it was said that the definition of an effective CEO reputedly changed from that of a competent manager to a charismatic leader. Um, and there was an example of this. Um, so there was a huge scandal involving Tyco. Um, and, but this was favorable. I mean, this was, um, this was uh, described, uh, this was a, it was a profile in Business Week 
the most aggressive CEO. This was great. This was a good thing. And Robert Monks, who, I mean, if you want to get a quote about corporate governance, he'll throw it all out there. He said, I don't think there's a better CEO in America. He was in, uh, um, Kozlowski was in jail for about 10 years soon thereafter. So this was how dramatic the celebrity CEO culture was developing. What were the implications for corporate governance? Well, with CEOs mattering more, what you wanted, you wanted to have the right person in charge, you wanted to have them with robust incentives to perform, and so what you had there was, uh, what was occurring in the 90s, it appeared, was a growing emphasis on linking executive pay with performance. Um, there was higher CEO turnover. It looked like governance was doing what it was supposed to do in the 1990s. Um, so, and this was corporate governance, really, in its full flourish. Um, Actually, no, nah, there was more to it. Because what was going to happen, and I think what I'll do, what time am I supposed to wrap up? How much longer do I have? I'm the monitor to, to, to be honest. <laughs> how much longer do you want me to talk for? How much, how much do you need? Well, I don't know. 12 minutes? Fine. All right. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so I will talk about corporate governance going international. Um, so what was happening was, um, I've talked to the, about the U.S. up to this point, and I've indicated through my slides that no one was talking about corporate governance um, in the other countries before the 1990s. Um, things changed in the early 1990s. It started in Britain um, with, uh, for those who follow corporate governance, probably the most famous report in the history of corporate governance was the Cadbury Report of 1992. Um, and what was crucial about this was it became an appendix to the stock exchange, London Stock Exchange listing rules, and what had to happen is it had a, this code at the back of it, and companies had to either comply with the code or they had to explain why not. And so corporate governance codes, dozens of countries have them now, and comply or explain is a crucial part of this. Um, Canada was a first mover in this, well not Britain was the first mover, but Canada got right on this because in 1994 there was the day report on uh, corporate governance and this led the TSE, the Toronto Stock Exchange, to bring in comply or explain uh, oriented around corporate governance in 1994. Um, now at the same time this was happening, um, you, uh, so that what you had was Australia, Canada, Britain, they got in there in the early 90s. Then, in the mid-90s, you began to have a situation where um, you began to have a situation where it was happening in Europe. Um, and because what was happening was, um, in the mid-90s, there were some corporate scandals in Europe. Uh, also, what was happening is that as European borders were breaking down with the single market, they needed more money. Uh, so they went to U.S. capital markets, but what happened was that um, there was a trade that if U.S. pension funds were going to give money to European public companies, they wanted to have higher corporate governance standards. So European companies had to think about this. It, the process repeated itself elsewhere in the late uh, 1990s with Asia, um, because what there was in the late 90s was that um, you had a 1997 stock market crash in Asia, um, and basically the U.S. was still riding high, and they're saying, well, you know, the way to get with the program is to become more like the U.S., and the way you do that is to bring in U.S. corporate governance models. Um, and because they could say, well, you have these tycoons and we don't. So, you know, you've got to shackle these people and you'll do it through corporate governance. And indeed, uh, there were studies which indicated that sounder corporate governance, they could get their capital more cheaply. So corporate governance had spread around the world by the end of the 1990s. Why were things different? So the UK, what you're talking about, the UK is viewed now as a corporate governance leader. Why did they wait until the early 90s? Why didn't they just, like the US, similar corporate governance? Why not? Well, a variety of reasons. One, um, the UK didn't have the SEC. The SEC was an early corporate governance promoter and a very effective one. The UK didn't have that. It had the London Stock Exchange, which wasn't going to be in the business of promoting better corporate governance. Um, with boards, what was happening too in Britain, and it's sort of hard to imagine, it was, I mean, you may have been, Jeremy Corbyn's become leader of the Labour Party, and he's quite left wing, and he is like a throwback to the 70s, and the 70s, they were there. What were they talking about in Britain then? It was how they were going to, and this looked like it was going to happen with the Labour government, how they were going to bring employee directors. Half the board was going to be made up of employee representatives. Needless to say, if you were a UK public company, or though you were interested in board structure, that was the top of your agenda. This sort of 
nonsense, what's happening in the states, who cares? I mean, we're talking a major reconfiguration, so that ended that. And so it wasn't until the, until the 1990s that they began to talk about corporate governance seriously. What about other countries? Well, here we go back to the ownership and control patterns. Um, ownership and control, the thing is, what I talk about in the U.S. was that managers were beginning to matter more, okay, because of changes to markets um, and so on. It, other countries, all the market changes were all happening, but the, the thing is that who owned the companies didn't change. And so what that meant was you didn't have to worry about these so much about your managers getting out of control because the dominant shareholders would simply keep a watch on them. So you didn't need the corporate governance until the 90s when you had a situation when basically U.S. investors said we want better corporate governance. What about Canada? Um, You'd think that Canada in the 70s would have, they'd have been paying attention. Why weren't they? Well, here I can only speculate because I haven't written about Canada. 1970s, there were no scandals here like there were in the US. That may have mattered. Canadian Securities Commissions, they were there, but they didn't have the clout of the SEC to promote better corporate governance. Finally, um, and uh, Nova Scotia is an exception, but throughout most of the country, there was corporate law reform occurred, and everyone was kind of going, hey, wow, we've solved everything. So maybe they just didn't think they really needed it. Right, so to begin to, so now we go back to the US. What happened was, it, it appeared I'd set things up in a situation where, um, uh, set things up so that, wow, you know, corporate governance have responded, this is all good, don't have to worry. Turned out, corporate governance as it existed at the, at the beginning of the, um, uh, around 2000, wasn't good enough. The way it was described was that the corporate governance, it, it could not cope with public companies, this is, this is Skeel again, um, with the mass producing new Icarian uh, heroes du jour and giving them the ability to take huge risks almost instantly. Market changes, they could do all sorts of things. The corporate governance changes, they just could not keep up. They just could not keep up. And so you had Enron, WorldCom, other scandals. Then you had the counter response. This started with Sarbanes-Oxley, which imposed a series of legislative restrictions on public companies, reinforced by changes to listing rules of prominent um, U.S. stock exchanges. Prediction was, by Barron's in 2003, goodbye the imperial CEO. So it proved. Um, according to Arthur Levitt, former chairman of the SEC, 2005, gone are the days of the autocratic, muscular CEO whose picture appeared on the covers of business magazines. The imperial CEO is no more. Similarly, Levitt said in 2005, said it wasn't actually regulation that was the driver here. Um, rather, we are experiencing a cultural change in America that's been building slowly, accelerated by Enron, WorldCom, and other corporate debacles. Wall Street Journal concurred in 2007, saying there was a new post-revolutionary generation of power in corporate America, exemplified by CEOs on shorter leashes, more beholden to their board of directors. Now, what you should be thinking as we come to 2007 is if you remember the financial crisis, you're going, what? Uh, what? Um, before I get to that, there was evidence that could sustain this. One, this is non-financial U.S. public companies. Their balance sheets in the mid-2000s were in great shape. Okay? They, had, you know, they had found governance religion. CEO pay, incredible as it might seem, fell in the 2000s. It fell. Um, and you had the 2008 financial crisis, what you would have expected to see is all sorts of scandals. When share prices dropped 50%, you didn't. Non-financials, you did not see it. Stress test, they passed with flying colors. But there were banks. Banks, the imperial CEOs, they survived Sarbanes-Oxley, they survived those scandals. Why? Because what they delivered in the early 2000s was phenomenal by the standards of the time stock market returns. So people went, oh, okay, imperial CEOs for banks, yeah, we need them. We need Richard Fold. We need Angela Mozilla. We need Stan O'Neill because they're delivering. Eh, it didn't work out so well. Uh, financial crisis after they you know, rolled the dice. Financial crisis governance really kicked in, you know, kind of after the horse, you know, bolted. But they fired CEOs, they were changing executive pay, all sorts of things during the financial crisis. The pressure did not let up when the crisis ended, so what you had by 2013, large banks burned by years of scandals, often with uh, swashbuckling CEOs at the helm, were turning to new bosses who sport well-polished veneers of boringness. Um, why did this happen? It wasn't driven by the market, it was more driven by regulation, unlike what Levitt said about non-financials.
Um, final step I want to talk about, shareholders became much more active in the 2000s. What were they? Well, what it was is, um, um, you know, it, it couldn't just be a situation where pu U.S. public companies could go totally boring in the, in the 2000s because hedge funds would have come, would have stepped in. Other institutional shareholders, they weren't that interested. Activist hedge funds, they were really interested. Um, you can debate whether activist hedge funds are good or bad for public companies, but they matter. So Kahan and Rock said in 2010 that because of hedge fund activism, CEOs felt embattled, not imperial, embattled. Um, and this has meant, a couple of quotes here, um, because of hedge fund activism, the balance of power has shifted to shareholders, according to USA Today. New York Times, 2014, corporate America, previously ruled by chief executives and boards, is racing to do shareholders bidding. Um, this happens because the mainstream institutional shareholders, they like hedge fund activism by and large, creating a happy complementarity. So activist hedge funds, they're not going away anytime soon. So to conclude, um, I've, I've, I've talked something about other um, countries, but what I'm really going to focus on to conclude, not surprisingly given I've emphasized the U.S., is it's not clear what's going to replace this managerial capitalism. There's been, been a bunch of terms, fiduciary capitalism, investor capitalism, shareholder capitalism, none has really taken hold. But regardless of how you, the new era is characterized, corporate governance has emerged as a significant feature. Um, it's even been said by uh, Ed Rock that the central problem of U.S. corporate law for the last 80 years, the separation of ownership and control has been largely solved. Whether it's true or not, you can argue. But what is definitely the case is that if you look at where the public company was in the 1950s and the 1960s and how it was governed then and how it's governed now, there have been a lot of changes. And this has happened under the umbrella of corporate governance. So the rise of corporate governance has had crucial implications. It's not just nomenclature. It's really changed things for public companies. Thanks. Sorry if I went a bit over. So why would it be different? Um, well, there's a variety of possibilities. One is simply the size of the economy. So what, it, what you've got is a situation where um, what happens is th there's a general tendency that the bigger the company, the more likely it is to have diffuse share ownership. Why is that? Well, what happens is as companies grow bigger, they need capital. So what they have to do is they have to issue more shares, and it tends to make ownership more diffuse. Um, and so what you're going to tend to have is that U.S. will kind of duh, and the U.K. will have bigger public companies than Canada will. So you're going to, that's going to create a tendency. But Mork offers a different explanation, and this would be more controversial. I'm, you know, I haven't written about it, so don't stand for this. But what he says is that basically Canada has kind of a crony capitalism. And what it's got is if you want to have deals struck between government and public companies, They'll stick better if you have dominant shareholders because you can count on them being there. And so what happens is he basically it's a way of it's a sideswipe at the nature of Canadian capitalism, essentially, and Canadian political culture, saying that what you've got is you've got a bunch of sweetheart deals between politicians and uh, large businesses, and they work better if you have dominant shareholders that the politicians can rely upon to keep the bargains. That's the nefarious explanation. Can I, following the point of politicians, when sure. I put a little gloss of the UK mm -hmm. in the 80s, it's cozier there, as you probably know, geographically, sure. mm -hmm. it's coziness. If there was an industrial, and I use the word advisedly, industrial crisis, mm -hmm. maybe in a group of companies or in a single company, uh, the government, in my experience, tended to intervene, not always publicly, but nudge, nudge, wink, wink. That was certainly true when I worked for Mrs. Thatcher. Um, really? Which companies were they saving? British Airspace is one that comes to mind. Right. In a weekend. Right. Okay. 
So that might explain why they didn't talk about a governance in the well, 80s. That's the only point I was making is I think I don't disagree right. with your pattern at all. But but computer in the UK, all of the interests and governments looking to avoid this, to stabilize that, and it really was on a nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Sometimes nudging the board, sometimes pushing, so the board changed management. Right. And, um, and I think that was an important factor in ensuring, in the British Air Space, it was the big one, was the turnaround and the share price fell to a pound. And Arnold Weinstock was going to take it over. And the government didn't want that to happen. Yeah, that, that to me is a rarity. I mean, really what was happening in Britain in the 80s and why you didn't get corporate governance, they felt they didn't really need it. And why was this? I mean, I would tell kind of the opposite story because what was happening in the 80s was that that's when you had Hanson and you had BAT and they were doing all sorts of takeovers. Yes. And what it was is that the reason, you know, you didn't need to worry about your boards very much because if a company was underperforming, Hanson would just buy it. Sure. And so I actually think in the 80s what it was is that was the, the market was going crazy in Britain. Not the, I mean, sure, if it, it's strategic sort of military things, maybe. But I mean, you're looking at brewers, you're looking at all sorts of industries. It was... They, were, they, they didn't care about their boards because they knew takeovers would do it. And so they faced the same phenomenon that the U.S. did when the takeovers ended, is go, what now? And then it was in the early 90s that the British went, oh, we better look to our boards. In a, in a nice, nice business like chocolate and drinks, the government, when, they, when Adrian and I were there and I succeeded him, the government was very interested in what Captain Shrek was doing in a number of things not necessarily domestically. Sure, they might have been interested, uh, but, and but- old, and, and had objectives to be achieved. Right. I, I yeah, I- wish were achieved. Right. Um, gee, uh, you know, ha hearing that Margaret Thatcher was, a, was the agent of state capitalism, that must be a pretty minority view. I mean, that, the 80s, you know, maybe there were elements of that. You obviously have some inside information but like in most of the corporate world in Britain in the 1980s, it was market forces went wild. So I think you're telling a very tiny slice of the story, even well, if you have inside information about it. Two companies of which I'm Sure, fine, but I mean, yeah. I just, you know, the vast majority of it, they just let it rip. That was what Thatcher was all about. Certainly compared to what they had in the 70s. Yes. Um, I can't figure out whether your conclusion is optimistic or not. <laughs> um, um, so I at this point, it's optimistic or just um, we're in a hiatus between the next before the next disaster. All right. So at this so point, the way I the way I've characterized it now is reasonably agnostic. Essentially, the point I'm seeking to make is that, in a taxonomic point of view, the public company functions, even though they continue to dominate, particularly in the U.S the way in which boards and shareholders interact and what you expect out of them is considerably different than it was 50 years ago. So then the testing question is, will the public company continue to be the dominant form of capitalism within the United States? Have these changes sufficed so that they can continue to meet the challenges? And that is a difficult question because what you've seen in the US is that IPOs have collapsed. So they don't, and, and then if you go back to the mid 2000s, there were lots of companies being taken private. Um, and you, you know, you, you, if you trawl around, you can find a series of people arguing that the public company's future is very dismal. I am less convinced of that. Um, if you still look at who dominates in the US, they are still publicly traded firms. There's all the unicorns out there, for example, that have billion uh, dollar value and they're still waiting to go public. Um, but ultimately the ones that are successful will. They're ones that will fade away, but they probably all will either end up either bought by, either will be bought by a publicly traded firm or they will go public or they will disappear. 
Um, the idea that they are going to stay over, say, 10, 12, 15, 20 years as a private company with a value of over a billion dollars, to me, seems unlikely. So they're going to end up channeled in as public companies. Public companies will continue to dominate. Um, of course, you know, is there another financial crisis coming around the corner? If I knew that, well, you know, I wouldn't be up here talking, I'd be investing. Um, but tentative conclusion, and it's something I'm thinking about, is that there is, is often the right term, depends on your view of the public company, that if what you're going to be thinking about is, I don't think the corporate governance with its orientation around public companies is going out of business anytime soon. It will be around, so will the public company. I don't know if that's optimistic, but that's <laughs> what I'd say. Uh, very interesting uh, lecture. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think you did a great job of telling a, a, sto a very complicated story in a very easily digestible way. If too fast. One, one thing I, I was curious though is that you didn't touch much on jurisprudence. And yep. I was wondering why is, is that because you, you don't feel that it has as much of a role to play or just more or of curiosity as your commentary on why you didn't touch as much on jurisprudence? Um, well, I have a paper that'll probably end up about 65 pages in print that's coming out talking about basically what was Delaware's contribution. To, and so, to, what, what was Delaware's contribution? Because, I mean, for those of you who don't know, Delaware is the premier corporate law state in the U.S. because it's where that's where 55, 60 percent of public companies are incorporated. And they have... Um, a court, they have a court system where they hear a lot of important cases. And the way I basically say it would be executive pay, Delaware was largely irrelevant um, because the statutes say nothing and the Disney case indicates they didn't want to regulate executive pay. Shareholder activism, you know, hedge funds, not really particularly significant. Um, but where they did matter was in two ways. One was I indicated that corporate governance changed when the take when takeovers ended because they suddenly when the tide went out they kind of had to go oh we better do something else if the takeover raiders aren't going to do it. Delaware jurisprudence did definitely play a role in ending or in, in greatly curtailing hostile takeovers. So that was one change. The other is that in terms of boards there were key Delaware decisions that what they did is they nudged and encouraged public companies to use independent directors. And so it, they were going with the grain, but it certainly reinforced the idea that independent directors should play a crucial corporate governance role. So it was definitely there, um, but again, it was only you know, that's a paper in which I've talked about it, definitely played a role, but it tended to be only in a subset of areas, and they tend to go with what was the governance grain ultimately. But in terms of ending takeovers, they were potentially important. They were important. Just, just a quick follow up. Sure. Because the, the Delaware chancellors are notorious for writing in academic journals and lecturing and yeah. doing all the things that academics do. Uh, do you think part of it may be also that their influence perhaps was more pervasive in that forum as opposed to necessarily in their judicial decisions? So the way that went down is that it, you have to cast your mind back, if, if you get your sense of what the Delaware courts, you know, they're so high profile, they're everywhere now. Things were way different in the mid 80s. They was just a quiet court, you know, everyone knew that companies were incorporated there. But if you were looking, if you picked up a 1982 edition of a case book, there were not a lot of high profile Delaware decisions in it. There was this synergy between the takeover cases in the 1980s and the influence that the Delaware courts had on those, but the, ta the takeover cases in the 1980s made the Delaware courts. It brought them high, so, and so the first really high profile judge there was William Allen. And what William Allen was the first one to get out there and write a ton of stuff. And he, you know, that was a late 80s, not, it was a 1990s phenomenon. And so I would say that by that point, you know, what they were doing is they were, they were trying to influence public companies through, what, through their writing. Um, uh, Leo Strine does it a lot. Um, but to the extent that they were doing this, it was tending to reinforce 
already existing norms, you know, have better boards, have more independent directors. But some of the sting was taken out of it with the Disney case, for instance, because when they didn't hold the board liable in Disney, you know, for all the stuff that Chandler was saying about, oh, you know, you can't have uh, an imperial prince running the Magic Kingdom and all this kind of stuff, which is what he said about Eisner, the board wasn't held liable. And at which point, you know, I think directors kind of went, oh, okay. You know, after Smith and Van Gorkum, where they actually were held liable, I mean, because it's another project I've worked on, the chances of a, of a director being held personally liable of a public company, at, you know, through state level court decisions, vanishingly small. And that, that has an impact because it kind of goes to kind of, you know, the, the cry wolf problem. <laughs> okay, yeah, you, you know, you, you can say hey, what we got to do, but, you know, if you don't, it doesn't stack up, then we're not going to, you know, they just begin to ignore it. So, um, it's complicated, definitely part of the story. But ultimately, and I'm not sure that the Delaware audience, when I was, gave, this, gave the talk, I think they were kind of going, oh, we want to hear we're really important. But I played it straight and called, you know, because it's going to end up as a paper. I don't want to you know, exaggerate, get it wrong. So significant, can't ignore it, but not dominant. Any other yes. questions? Yes. Thank you for this. I teach corporate governance across the street at our school of business. I was just wondering, it's a very nice uh, summary from different perspectives of the evolution of co governance. I was wondering, what do you think about uh, the 1993 SEC, the requirement, disclosure of executive compensation, how has it helped? Helped? Oh, or it, the other way around? It, it helped make, see, it, it helped CEOs get a lot richer. Um, it, I mean, it had a, it had a counterproductive effect. I mean, what it did is the, the, the disclosure just meant you could find out more readily what other executives made. Um, disclosure, the idea that disclosure is going to bring down executive pay is no. Disclosure accelerates executive pay. Um, the 1992, I mean, and the thing is, this is a project I'm actually working on right now, is like, why was it that, why, so the interesting issue in part was executive pay in the U.S., the way things worked was um, it rocketed it up in the 80s and the 90s, but from the 40s to the 70s, it did nothing. It was flat. In fact, in fact, they lost ground. So what we're investigating is why, like what, what quote unquote worked during that era. And the way we talk about disclosure, I, it, it, there's a variety of things going on, but I think the norm structures changed. I think the influence of unions changed. A whole bunch of things changed, and what that meant is disclosure and what it could do, like in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, disclosure probably scared executives, and they would not take as much money as they otherwise would. So it was kind of scary. But then through the 80s, when basically the norm structure of public companies changed, and ties into what I've talked about, people by the 90s were thinking that executives were way more important than they used to think they were in the 70s. So by the 90s, what was happening is they were going, we need to have our superstar CEOs, we need to align pay with performance. And what that would mean is if they deliver the goods, we've got to pay them a lot. And then adding fuel to the fire would be, oh, well, what we're going to do is we're going to throw a lot more information out there so they can find out just how much their rival across the street is being paid. And then, you know, then what you've got is the exact comp people would go, yeah, well, they'd go to the boards and what would happen is, you go to the boards and they go, the exec comp people, would, the advisors would go, look board, do you think you have a below average company? And of course, no, of course not. No. Do you think you have a below average CEO? No, 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 of course not. And then what you would do is you go, okay, we have all this raft of data that we've got from the SEC that indicates that in fact, your CEO is paid below average. I think it's time to get with the program reflect the fact that this is an, a, a, like a great CEO. And of course, what we'll do is we'll have a lot, it'll all be performance oriented. I mean, you know, that's the way you cover it. And we'll throw the stock options at this person or the restricted stock arrangements. And we will recognize just how wonderful a company you have and just what a wonderful CEO you've got. And you could use the disclosure. So it accelerated things in the 90s in ways that in the 50s and 60s would have damped things down. But on the other side, look at Michael Jensen. He mm -hmm. said, well, if that one were there, these people would be robbing everything, even the bricks and mortars, and would be taking to their houses, you know, because no one would be knowing what they're doing and 
they are taking everything from that corporation. At least we know right now. And sure. That is activism said, hey, enough is enough, stop that. So there is a better relationship, I think. Maybe, I still haven't seen anyone that said, I mean, the, the idea that, you, sure, you know what they're, t they're taking, I guess, but the idea that that has had any depressing effect on CEO pay, I, I don't think so. Um, you know, I mean, Gareth, Gareth Crystal, who's a, a well-known, uh, so he said, um, in the, he said in the late the 1990s, it was actually his early 2000s, he said he could not believe what happened, because he was an advisor to the SEC in the early 90s, and he wanted to get executive pay down. He found religion and wanted to get executive pay down. So he advised me, he said, you know, what you gotta do is you gotta enhance disclosure. And he could not believe that these executives would so shame, you know, so unashamed take more money. He's, what? This isn't the way things are supposed to go down. And lo and behold, they went, yep. And you had Kozlowski, and you couldn't give him enough money. So, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. All right, great. Um, thanks also. This is a great presentation. I think you really present a compelling sort of historical uh, overview of the changes. But I, I, I'd love to hear uh, maybe a few more thoughts uh, on the role of maybe technology and some of these changes. You mentioned in the mm -hmm. context of sort of weakening opinions, but I was wondering if you could say something more about the maybe the challenge to corporate governance posed by technology in the context of the rise of high frequency trading, uh, algorithmic trading, even virtual currencies like Bitcoin cryptocurrencies. So where I would see it coming from more with the story that I'm developing um, would be what well, technology is really important. Why is it important? Well, what I've argued is that corporate governance was a response to a situation where managers were operating with fewer constraints than they previously had. Now what happened was that um, in the 80s and the 90s is that it became possible through technological innovation for dis, I mean, and it all seems so primitive as to what the internet was in the 90s and whatever, but what they were able to do is that with technology, you could take on the first movers so much more readily than you could before. You I mean, Amazon, I mean, you just have to look at that and go, well, wow, what they did to retail through technology. Um, you, and you just look at, I mean, you can look at Microsoft, how they rose and took on IBM and, and stopped them. Then Microsoft gets taken out. That's all technology. Now, tech is a little tricky, though, because it throws up some interesting governance twists, like Google, which have dominant shareholders, which is kind of different. And um, you've got a situation where, you know, is Google going to become, is it kind of like a 60s conglomerate? One or the, or what, the other thing it could be um, is, and I think a parallel could work, because I'm still thinking about this, and I think the paradigmatic company for tracking through how U.S. corporate governance evolved was AT&T. Um, because it went from a situation where it was, you know, it was the, pri it was the quintessential managerial corporation, um, and then it got disrupted. Um, and what it had, though, as an example of its statesmanlike, and again, I use the term advisedly, was Bell Labs. And, you know, it was phenomenal the amount of, they threw at it. And, you know, but then it was brought down by changing market circumstances. Deregulation was obviously pivotal there, but so was technology. I mean, part of the thing that was going on as to why they couldn't have the telephone monopoly is, you know, cellular phones and the whole thing, and just, it all just fell down. I mean, that's technology driving it. Anyway, what is Google? And the parallel I find kind of intriguing, I'll need to think about it a little bit more, is Google is kind of like Bell Labs. They're throwing all this money at these, you know, electric cars, for goodness sake. I mean, it's not a standard conglomerate which goes out and buys the businesses. It's trying to build them. It's experimenting. And, you know, we'll see how that plays out. Even Google, with their dominant shareholders, they kind of go, well, we better separate it out because the markets find it a little bit confusing, not surprisingly. So anyway, to make a, that's a sort of a, you know, that was, but technology really is important to the story. It's high speed trading and how important is it to the story? Well, I've got a paper which argues that in fact, you'd be surprised at how effective share price, op, you know, how effective stock markets were in terms of um, translating information into prices over a hundred years ago. Uh, they did it, the, the amount of information in the market was not particularly substantial, but they were super fast.
People go, well, the telegraph, well, that's a joke. But the fact of the matter is that prices and developments, they got priced in like that really, really fast. Um, and so how important, it, so I, my initial reaction is that I don't see that that is having huge changes. I'd be more likely to see things like ETFs as having a huge impact um, because they're real passive shareholders more than, than high speed trading. It's not really even what hedge funds do, not the kind of activist hedge funds. They go in, they can, they can get a big stake pretty fast by virtue of technology, by, but so technology really matters, but not quite the way you framed it. Sure. And maybe just to come back, just so I'm clear, sure. with your analogy in Google and ATT, so basically sell Google shares if you got <laughs> Well, you know, AT&T had a pretty good run for quite a long time. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's, you know, what, what's your horizon? Um, and of course, the thing is that um, AT&T, they ultimately had hinged on a government monopoly. The key here is that it, it's been a privately constructed, not monopoly, but you know what I mean. They're dominant, right? And it's going to be hard to displace that. Um, they should have a pretty good run as long as they can do that. Um, but. You know, the thing is, if you've got such a phenomenal company, the fact that they engage in a little bit of uh, private benefits of control, you know, you still, there are lots of companies where there's some private benefits of control that you kind of go, yeah, I wouldn't mind grabbing those coattails. Google might be like that. So. But that wasn't advice. No, no, no. As I said, I wouldn't be doing this. If it was worth anything, I wouldn't be here. You know, I'd, be, you know, I'd be in my yacht. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I'll be really hoping to see you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.